name is Ken Bryan. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of Terrestrial Energy. Uh, Terrestrial Energy is a gold sponsor of this event and uh, fourth time sponsoring Clean Tech Forum San Francisco. My eighth, time, my eighth time attending, I believe. I, I, I somewhat lost count, but I think it's been eight times. And uh, so just a little bit about Terrestrial Energy. Uh, we are the global market leader uh, in the development of advanced nuclear power technology. And uh, we, uh, our system is called the Integral Molten Salt Reactor, or the IMSR. And the IMSR can deliver low-cost electric power and also uh, heat power for industry, uh, including, for example, uh, the, um, the capability of, of producing hydrogen green hydrogen, and uh, our, our system can produce the lowest cost green hydrogen in the global market. So um, this session is called the uh, Terawatt Transition, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, uh, Kirsty Bougain, who is the chair of this session. So over to you, Kirsty. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Kevin. Thanks so much uh, Terrestrial Energy for sponsoring this event and Cleantech Group for hosting us. Um, it's so great to be here in person, in real life. Um, and you know, this conference always brings like really kind of deep, insightful and wonderful conversations um, that really move the discourse forward. So we're really happy to be here. Um, my, my name is Kirsty Gogan, as Canon said, and co-founder of TerraPraxis, which is a climate Nonprofit, um, and I guess the kind of hallmark of what we do is, is you know, really look at the terawatt scale, um, because uh, despite you know 25 years of building public and political support for action on climate, we haven't made a dent on the rising trajectory of emissions year on year. Uh, 25 years ago, 80% of our energy came from fossil fuels, and Today, 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Um, so, you know, we do need to start thinking a little bit differently. And um, the theme of the conference, I think, is really interesting as well. The, the gap between aspirations and reality, or the gap between our ambition and the outcomes, the results that we're achieving. So, you know, really starting to think hard about how we close that gap. And that's not only in the electricity sector, where a lot of our attention tends to be, or has been, uh, for good reasons. Um, but that's only, of course, about 20% of our energy consumption. The other 80% in the non-power sectors um, represent some of the really toughest to decarbonize parts of the problems we all know. Um, in the energy sector, that includes you know, industry and transport, um, and I guess the conversation today will focus on, you know, the role that advanced nuclear technologies could potentially play in helping to close that gap. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, three really incredible uh, panelists. So I'm very excited to get the conversation started. I'll invite each of you to make some opening remarks um, and then ask you some questions and we'll get into the discussion. I really hope that we'll get some good questions from you all in the, in the audience as well. So I'd like to start by um, introducing Rita, Rita Barron-Wall, a great friend of ours, uh, just uh, recently um, been appointed uh, Chief Technology Officer at Westinghouse Electric Company, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm hoping that Rita, we're going to see you appear on the screen any moment now. Rita, unfortunately, isn't with us in person, but I'm really, really happy that you are able to join us virtually. So, hi, Rita. Can you see us and hear us okay? I can hear you and see you, and oh my goodness, I look uh, clearly more than life on the screen. Yeah, you look fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> As always. Uh, I wish I could be with you. Um, you will not be envious of the fact that I was shoveling snow earlier today. So um, really, really wish I could be with you in person, but I'm happy to connect uh, virtually and look forward to the conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, it's a little warm here for my taste. <laughs> no, it's beautiful, beautiful. 
Okay, so do you, would you like to, to kick off with some opening remarks? Yeah. Absolutely. So let me um, share my screen. I think we can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, here we go. All right. How's that look? That looks perfect. Perfect. Okay. So as um, Kirstie said, I'm Rita Barrymore, and I want to thank Clean Tech as well as Terrestrial for the opportunity to chat with you today. Um, nuclear energy is something that I have devoted my entire career to and I'm very, very passionate about it and uh, just want to share a little bit of what Westinghouse does in this space and then very much looking forward to the conversation that we will have in a few minutes here. Um, as Kirsty said, uh, this is day six for me uh, on the job, so I'm happy to give you a bit of an overview about Westinghouse and also why nuclear is so vital to the decarbonization and the climate conversation. Um, over the next 20 years, we, we know that the world population is expected to grow by about 25%, and the demand, more importantly, for electricity is going to double. And so we really need to find a solution that is going to support those increased, not only electricity needs, but energy needs, but also help address and possibly reverse the impacts of climate change during this time. Westinghouse's mission is to help shape tomorrow's energy together for a cleaner and better future. And we firmly believe that using nuclear power can help meet the demands um, that we can help in, in a way that we couple with, with renewable power um, to ensure that there is always accessible carbon-free uh, electricity that's supported and, and provided to a power grid. So in, this, this slide kind of gives you in a nutshell what Westinghouse is. It's the most comprehensive nuclear technology provider. We provide not only from the design aspects all the way to the operation, to the maintenance, to the training, to the extension of life, to when the time comes to helping uh, utilities retire their assets. We have been around for over 130 years and we have been innovating every step of the way. Nuclear power has always been a clean energy source. It is not something uh, that we are in technology space tweaking to make clean. It, is, it has always been that type of source. Uh, so a little bit about Westinghouse, we have about 9,000 employees that are located all around the world in 19 different countries and are located at more than 70 different facilities. The technology that has been developed throughout the decades at Westinghouse is the basis for nearly half of the world's operating nuclear power plants today. So I want to take a moment to talk about one very particular innovation, um, and it's called the Evinci Microreactor. It is transportable, it is resilient, and it certainly stems out of very innovative thinking. Why Evinci uh, is, is being talked about right now and in these circles is that it offers a solution to clean energy needs wherever one might be. So for example, um, some potential users could be remote island communities, uh, communities that currently rely on uh, expensive fossil heavy diesel, uh, defense applications, military applications, disaster relief, uh, all could benefit from this one type of uh, reactor size. Um, some, some of the facets of the even two micro reactor are that it's reliable, it is cost competitive, it's sustainable and that it provides the clean carbon free energy that nuclear is renowned for, it's resilient, um, it is transportable, so you can uh, minimize the efforts and costs that are required to build the reactor on site. And it, it has baked into a technology uh, that has been created over the past several years. So there's major, major possibilities. As I mentioned, it has a small footprint because it is a micro-reactor. So typically, um, for those that may not be familiar, a micro-reactor, we're talking 20 megawatts or smaller. And so that's the generally accepted definition. Um, you can go a little bit higher and definitely smaller as well. 
um, because it is nuclear, it eliminates the need for diesel or a coal fuel supply chain. It's nuclear, so there's no greenhouse gas emissions and can play very nicely with renewables on microgrids. Like I said, it's transportable. And what that means is 100% factory built, fueled, and assembled. And it can be installed in less than 30 days, has a 40 year design life, and can, can offer three years of continuous power without needing to be refueled. And first and foremost, it is designed with safety in mind and offer safe shutdown without the need for any human action. Um, this goes into a little bit more of the nitty gritty and the technical side of things. It's based on heat pipe technology, but I'm gonna um, leave this slide up for a moment. Happy to answer questions on the technology if um, you are interested. But I will end uh, with this slide and I'll stop sharing for a moment and hand it back to Kirsty. Fantastic, thank you, thank you so much. Wow, so you know, these little micro-reactors replacing diesel generators, these really targeted, very impactful applications. Um, you know, the, the, so the session's titled The Terawatt Transition. So what kind of actions, Rita, do you think we need to be undertaking over the course of this decade, this like remaining eight years of this decade to 2030, which is a kind of key milestone when we expect to see many of these technologies being demonstrated and commercialized so that we're ready to deploy them at that scale that's needed um, to really address these very large markets. So, so there's a few things we need to do. First and foremost, we need to ensure that our existing nuclear power plants mm -hmm. continue to operate. Right. That is the cheapest way to decarbonize at the moment. So that's number one. Number two is to, uh, to be able to quickly deploy and build up a supply chain of new nuclear plants. So whether it's a micro-reactor, which is small, uh, a small modular reactor, which is mid-sized, or a gigawatt-sized reactor like the AP-1000 that Westinghouse also um, has designed and, and constructed. Um, so we need to have a variety of sizes being deployed in the near term, as well as a variety of coolant technologies. So Cannon talked about the terrestrial um, integral design. Um, but there are numerous different technologies that serve a variety of different purposes as well. And so we have certainly electricity generation, we have hydrogen generation, we have the ability to desalinate water to generate medical isotopes to provide a heat source to crypto mining um, activities and manufacturing activities. So the more nuclear that we can deploy, the more robust the supply chain that we have, and then you start to be able to essentially churn out these power plants and it becomes more of a manufacturing process than a first of kind. And that's gonna be really, really important in the next eight years. Fabulous, thank you so much. And that's a perfect segue um, to Jeff, I'll come to you next. So Jeff Navin, uh, co-founder of Boundary Stone Partners and, um, uh, and also the Government Relations Director for TerraPower. So we've been hearing uh, from Rita about the sort of very wide range of potential applications, um, which really sort of creates a much broader value proposition for nuclear technologies. I think that we've really tended to appreciate when we've sort of thought traditionally about nuclear energy as supplying, you know, just sort of always on, very reliable, clean electricity, but it can do a lot more than that. Um, what are the near-term priorities? How do we articulate that value proposition and then how do we realize it? Yeah, so thank you, Christy, and, and thanks, Canon and Terrestrial for, for sponsoring this. Uh, Terrestrial's doing some really innovative and great stuff, so we're, we're proud to be uh, uh, here, here with them. So TerraPower was founded about 15 years ago by Bill Gates, and we really were born out of this question. You know, uh, Bill, as he is wont to do, had a group of very smart people sit around a table, and he asked the question, is there a technology that we need to bring to market to help us solve the dual challenges of global energy poverty and climate change? Uh, and that won't come to the market unless somebody like me steps up and, and makes some, some investments. And uh, out of that, Terra Power was born. The idea that they came up with very quickly is that we are not going to solve climate change and meet the growing global demand for uh, energy without something that looks and feels a lot like nuclear. And Bill being Bill said, is there a way that we can do it that uh, brings a step change improvements in terms of economics, safety, 
uh, and, and proliferation resistance. So that's really who we are. That's, we are a company that is, that is trying to solve that problem. And as we've started uh, looking at a whole variety of designs, we've come up with uh, something that we think is really well suited for 21st century grids. Um, we have the natrium technology, which is a sodium cooled fast reactor, and it differs from traditional reactors in a few ways. First, it's a lot smaller. It's 345 megawatts. Um, you know, it's redimensioned, the AP1000 and the, most of the Gen 2 and Gen 3 reactors are gigawatt size, so we're about a third smaller. Um, and that, uh, we think, makes it more attractive for utilities that are looking to write a check. Uh, we want to keep the overall cost of the plant, you know, around a billion dollars, which is something that they're, that they're used to spending. Um, but we wanted to size it right for, for the current utility market. The second piece is that we have enhanced safety designs by being an advanced reactor. Um, most, uh, all of the operating reactors in the United States are cooled by water. It's a technology that's served us very well. It's worked very, very well. Um, but when you have water as your coolant, you have to be concerned about that water boiling off, right? And then the reactor core gets too hot. The core literally melts down, which is where that term comes from. Uh, so we use sodium as a coolant. Our, our boiling point of our coolant is 882 degrees Celsius. Uh, it can't boil off because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, our reactor core doesn't get hot enough to boil it off. That allows us to create a design that's much simpler. We don't need all of the belts and suspenders to put pressurized water constantly flowing over the core. Uh, and that uh, increased safety case actually increases our economic case as well. The third thing that we're doing differently is um, a relatively recent addition to the design, and it's really designed to integrate into grids that are attempting to get to 100% clean. All of the reactors in the United States right now uh, operate like most thermal plants. They, they boil water, that water creates steam, that steam spins a turbine, and then there's copper and magnets, just like that fourth grade experiment you did where you got a little bit of light to come out of the light bulb. Um, instead of using the heat from our reactor to just directly generate steam, we use the heat to power a very large molten salt energy storage system. So anybody here who's familiar with concentrated solar knows uh, what molten salt energy storage is. This is an off-the-shelf product. We can store 500 megawatts of electricity for up to five and a half hours. Just to put that into context, for those of you who aren't in the energy storage space, that's four times larger than the big uh, Tesla lithium-ion battery storage facility that's currently operating in Australia, which I think is still the largest one in the world. So what does that give us? It gives us an opportunity to produce carbon-free baseload power at 345 megawatts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But we can also ramp up and down up to 500 megawatts for up to five and a half hours. So we are designed to integrate into grids with high penetrations of wind and solar. We are building our first plant, thanks in part to Rita uh, through her work on her previous job. Uh, we were selected as part of the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program to demonstrate the, natrium, the first natrium plant, which we're building in Kemmerer, Wyoming, at the site of a coal plant that's slated to be retired. So uh, why Wyoming? Um, uh, well, West Wyoming, as anyone who's ever been to Wyoming knows, uh, it's very windy. And they have a lot of wind power on their grid there. Um, uh, our utility partner, Pacific Core Rocky Mountain Power, is making more investments into wind, but as they have more variable technologies putting onto the grid, they need something that can provide power when the wind isn't blowing and can ramp up and down to meet that demand. Also, just kind of a, a, another piece I think is really important is by building this at the site of a coal plant that's slated to be retired, we are going to be able to take that union workforce at the coal plant and walk them across the road and have them come to work at our plant. Uh, nuclear uh, pays more than any other subsector in energy. They tend to be union jobs. Uh, when we build our plant in Kemmerer, it'll have a, a license operating lifetime of 60 years with the potential to have that license extended for 80 years. There is no other entity in the world that can show up to any community and promise high paying jobs for 60 to 80 years, and we're able to do that. It gives those folks who are working in the fossil fuel industry an opportunity to get good jobs in the clean energy uh, economy and to do it without taking a pay cut and without having to move their families. So we think that's a really, really important uh, uh, piece as well. So uh, uh, again, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty ambitious technology. Uh, uh, we're able to do this in part because of our partnership with the, with the Department of Energy. 
Uh, but we think that not only can nuclear play well with renewables, that it actually, when deployed in the right way, can uh, enable more variable technologies to be put onto the grid. Fantastic, thank you. And I think you have a pretty ambitious timeline as well for switching this on, right? Yeah, um, uh, it's, uh, under the Advanced Director Demonstration Program, which is a 50-50 cost share between uh, TerraPower and the U.S. government, uh, we have a seven-year time frame, uh, so we will be turning our reactor on in 2028. Fantastic. Well, I think that's one of the perceptions, actually, that needs to you know, be updated, which is how near a lot of these technologies really are now. You know, there's, there's multiple technologies that are in that sort of demonstration commercialization phase. And again, I kind of come back to this big question around, you know, what do we need to be doing now to make sure that when these technologies come to market, we're ready, the markets are primed, and we can actually really deploy at scale. But I just want to come back to one thing that you were saying about this, this community, because, you know, we have a huge challenge with coal globally, even in countries with old coal, it's really difficult to, you know, shut down those coal plants. It's devastating for those communities, the loss of jobs, the loss of revenues from taxes and so on. Um, and, and then, of course, even in the larger global fleet, you know, you have an average age of less than 14 years old for these plants. So the prospect of shutting down these, these coal plants is very, very challenging. Uh, it's the single largest source of global carbon emissions. Um, and, uh, you know, there's trillions of dollars locked up in, in those investments. So um, repowering coal with nuclear, you know, has really taken off, I think, this year um, as a major new sort of theme, as a major new opportunity for nuclear technologies. At, at COP26, repowering coal was, you know, the, the kind of key application that we were hearing about, including from the Energy Secretary, um, uh, Jennifer Granholm. Um, and you're doing it, right? So, you know, the interesting thing is that these coal plants exist in kind of quite complex socio-economic, political ecosystems. It's not just a case of saying, they, they, there's emissions, shut it down. The prospect of offering a kind of, you know, a lifeline or a renewal um, for these communities is really incredible. So how is it landing? What is the response being from the community? So it's been incredible. Um, I mean, this is a community of 2,700 people that has a, a coal plant and a gas plant um, adjacent to a coal mine, you know, the largest employer in the county, um, um, significant amount of jobs for a community of that size. Um, we, um, um, at, the, at this time, I think there's about 100 to 125 workers at the coal plant. Mm -hmm. We'll have between 200 and 250 permanent workers. We're also going to have, uh, at peak construction, 2,500 skilled crafts, craftsmen and women working on the project. So, uh, you know, this is a community that went from worrying about how they were going to be able to hang on to now they're worried about how are we going to deal with the influx of all of these people that are going to come into our community and all the jobs that are going to, that are going to be there. Wow. Um, you know, uh, there's also been this narrative that, you know, nuclear, the problem with nuclear is that nobody's going to want one of these in their community or in their backyard. Um, when we decided to, to look at Wyoming, we actually looked at, there are, four, there are four communities that have coal plants that were slated to be retired. And we didn't just select one. We said we're open to all four and we asked for community engagement and involvement to see who wanted it. What we found was all four of those communities very much wanted this plant to be built um, in their communities. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Kemmerer uh, uh, Water District just sent out uh, the last month's water bill and they put a survey and they're asking people if they supported the project. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was 86% in favor and 8% opposed, which in this political environment, I don't think you can get 86% of people to agree on anything. So, uh, um, you know, I think, I think if there is a lesson there for us that if we can actually talk about the benefits that our technology can provide to communities, um, and it's consistent across the country, you see the highest support for nuclear power um, are the communities that host nuclear power plants. If you have a plant in your community, that community is going to be very, very supportive. So we as an industry have to do a much better job of telling the story about the value that we can provide, not only to the, to the climate of the grid, but to the communities in which we, uh, in which we uh, do business. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a dense power, energy dense source, um, that it has a very tiny environmental footprint, as we've been hearing about. But the flip side of that is that very, the vast majority of the population have never had any first-hand experience of nuclear energy. So it does create this vacuum, I think, that affects public um, perception. So 
Great job, thank you so much. So I'll turn now to Connor Kelly, who's the Sustainability Lead for Azure Global. And Connor, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Microsoft is you know, a real leader in this, in this field. Um, your rigor and ambition, and the combination of rigor and ambition, and uh, really sort of like focusing on outcomes um, is, you know, really a, a, you're sort of demonstrating um, you know, how, how we should be doing things and setting incredible ambition, including, I think, being one of the first companies to announce that you were intending to be carbon negative for all of your historical emissions, which, you know, is a kind of something to look out for. I think it's, it's not going to be acceptable for very much longer just to be carbon neutral. It's very soon we're going to need to be carbon negative too. So tell us a bit about your, your experience in your work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that carbon negative decision was simply born out at trying to take a very clear eyed view of what needs to happen, not just for Microsoft, but for the entire global economy and every company within it. Um, so I think it was around 2015 that we started thinking seriously about this, um, trying to understand uh, climate change and um, what impacts that would have on Microsoft, but also the types of policies that would be adopted globally, uh, the type of regulation, and how that would adopt, um, impact technology adoption, and then how we could accelerate that. There's two broad strands for how we try and do that. Um, so the first is around uh, the policies that we set, so the carbon commitments and power purchasing. And then the second is the creation of software. So Microsoft at its heart is a software company, and we have a lot of good software developers. Um, and so we can put that uh, to work for accelerating customers and partners in um, achieve, you know, accelerating these types of areas. Um, so on the, the carbon commitments, um, around 2015, um, Microsoft brought in an internal carbon tax. And uh, that was a really interesting experiment to try and incentivize internal business groups at Microsoft. Um, it also collected money into uh, a city. So that money was ring-fenced. It was $15 a tonne. Um, each business group paid it on all of their carbon emissions, um, and that money accumulated into a fund, an internal sustainability fund, which was ring-fenced for sustainability projects. So that money, over the next two or three years, funded some really impressive, uh, exciting projects um, inside of Microsoft around the world, everything from energy efficiency to software development. One of the projects put distributed solar systems on school and hospital buildings. Um, and uh, that was you know, not just from an energy procurement point of view, but also equitable decarbonization, getting money into sustainability, or getting money into uh, communities, sometimes disadvantaged communities, which I think resonates hugely with the repower of coal efforts. Um, that carbon fee doubled two years ago, the, the internal carbon fee, but we learned a huge amount at that time, um, and that laid the groundwork for setting the uh, target of carbon. Um, carbon negativity by 2030. So, you know, we are currently cutting carbon emissions as much as possible, um, but there are still um, emissions that the company causes. And so uh, we, in tandem, each year to cutting emissions are uh, purchasing carbon removal, so permanent carbon removal. And um, by 2030, we'll be removing more than we create. And by 2050, uh, we will have removed all carbon emissions ever created by the company. And I think that's like quite relevant to this example because it's really just taking a very clear look and um, really strongly trying to avoid tokenism in commitments and thinking about what needs to happen um, to avert climate change. Climate change is probably one of the single biggest risks to Microsoft and to other companies. And so um, from a business point of view, it's very easy to make the case to address it in any way we can. Um, another area for uh, carbon emission reduction is power purchasing. And so around similar time frame, 2015, Microsoft set uh, our first um, renewable energy purchasing um, goal, which is around our data centers. So purchasing renewable energy globally for our data centers. About three years ago, we revisited that goal to start to think about how we actually get to fully decarbonized grids, that just adding new renewables. So renewables are fantastic for a cheap source of energy, but they only get you so far in terms of decarbonization. And then there are also these difficult to decarbonize sectors around industrial heat and so on. And so we wanted to revisit that goal. Um, and at that time, we started to uh, think about 24 7 hourly power purchasing and how we get. Um, this continuous supply of carbon-free energy. And there's no doubt that in the short term there are gaps there that can't be filled with renewables alone. And so SMRs are just a very good fit for trying to fill that gap. And we're trying to think here, this um, 
uh, this event is all about just understanding those gaps. And so it comes from taking a very clear view of exactly what needs to happen and setting those goals. And then finally, we get to um, our software work. And so um, we have software development teams around the world. We work with uh, customers um, and partners to try and accelerate. We create software to accelerate uh, the achievement of you know, your products, essentially, you're bringing to market. Um, my, I and my team are focused on environmental and sustainability scenarios, and so Repowering Co is a great fit for that um, to try and accelerate this change, essentially. Um, and so it's been really exciting to work with you on that, to create these tools to try and uh, accelerate this project, and um, greatly look forward to doing so over the next few years. Fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you for all your amazing work. I mean, it's, it's really incredible to forge partnerships like this. Um, which is sort of multi-sector and very outcomes driven but combining you know very broad range of, of talents and expertise to, to get to get to work together. Um, so um, that's that's fantastic. You mentioned risk, um, one thing climate being one of the biggest risks to Microsoft and other companies and indeed you know to, <laughs> to all of us um, the great existential risk and I'm just a bit surprised that the, the risk of climate isn't sort of you know better appreciated like we the the risk of failing to decarbonize is really very significant and when we look at um, you know we have lots of successes but we're really far off track in terms of the rates and scale of deployments that are needed for clean energy technologies um, and you know the time the time sensitivity and sequencing and scale of the net zero transition represents just an unbelievable logistical challenge. You know, to that needs to happen in every country around the world simultaneously over the course of the next 28 years. And as Rita was pointing out, we need to not only replace all of our fossil fuel infrastructure but potentially double or triple it as well. So I guess it's sort of looking at this in with a clear eye view that's led you and your colleagues at Microsoft to uh, diversify your strategies, including looking again at nuclear technologies. And tell us about you know a bit of the journey that you've undergone to you know really sort of see nuclear technologies as being viable and useful and any potential applications, particularly for heat, I guess, in you know, data centers, remote coal. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's all about trying to understand needs now and into the future, and um, extrapolate what that would look like for like something like renewable energy purchasing for a data build out plan, and trying to understand exactly what that means. And um, there's quite a long roadmap uh, lead time to build data centers and get power procurement in place. Yeah. And so that involves quite a lot of granular detail in terms of research for what is possible. Um, we work quite a lot with energy suppliers around the world in that regard um, to delve into technologies that could potentially meet those different areas. Um, something that uh, we chatted about yesterday, so Microsoft have uh, advertised some roles for SMR experts um, over the last year or two, which is just another way um, of trying to understand all the diversity of technologies that are available to um, meet the core business requirements for what Microsoft are trying to do in terms of providing cloud services and software development, um, but then to assess the ways of doing that in a, in a way that completely decouples business operation from carbon emissions, which is essentially just a microcosm for what we need to do right across the global economy, right? Just decouple productivity from carbon emissions. If we can do that, then we are we are sorted, right? Yeah. But like, really, that's, that's not easy to do. You make it sound very simple. <laughs> well, now we have our goal, we can work towards it. Absolutely. Um, and so it's just about uh, taking a realistic look at the technologies uh, that are required and working back from um, on the time frame for what needs to happen now and then going for it, basically. Um, and so you'll see that reflected in the areas that we're looking in and the areas that we're trying to work with customers and partners from a software development point of view yeah. to accelerate those technologies that need to happen. We I have to say, we've been like so impressed and inspired by the kind of levels of dedication and commitment and you know, de determination that we've found with so many of your colleagues at Microsoft. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, Rita, I'll, I'll come to you and I'd love to ask you um, just to sort of double click on this, um, you know, very particular useful attribute of nuclear technology, which is 
but it produces heat. It's really useful um, for all kinds of things. Would you like to just explore that a little for us? Sure, sure. So actually, I just had a conversation with my team uh, this morning about you know um, Bitcoin and, and mining and how, um, how prevalent that has become, and the fact that you know the, the Bitcoin and crypto mining companies really are agnostic to the heat source that's going to help power their, their servers and their day-to-day -day activities. And so it's you know very interesting and, and certainly um, I think uh, lucrative potentially to the nuclear industry to be engaging in those kinds of conversations where you know one you know, the industry didn't even exist you know a few decades ago, but two it's um, an industry that has no preconceived notions. They just want a source, a heat source that can generate. The power that they need to continue in, in, in their business. That's one. The other is when you look, uh, I, I believe it was Jeff who talked about um, lifting society, um, societies out of poverty. And when you talk about not only providing electricity to a community, but also being able to help desalinate water, mm -hmm. um, which is frankly probably, uh, after we get through the pandemic, the biggest crisis that the world is facing is water scarcity. Um, right now, water is desalinated using a very, very fossil intensive process. So if you can deploy a, for example, an SMR to a community that relies on desalinating water, but also provide it that desalinated water cleanly and providing a clean electricity source, that's a two for one, really. So this is the value of that nuclear power plant is much higher than it might be in a deployment in a traditional community. Um, and then also just, the, uh, you know, Jeff talked about the number of jobs that are created, the number of good paying jobs. I think that's really important um, in, in the conversation as well. Yeah, thank you. That, that's, um, that's a pretty exciting prospect that, you know, these repowered plants, these re repowered coal plants are not only, you know, um, going to create economic prosperity, high-skilled jobs, and, you know, the prospect of, you know, continued stable, reliable employment and, you know, flexible energy generation for decades to come, but also potentially diversifying into other energy services, you know, directly supplying heat, Industry. So these repowered coal plants could be transformed from being, you know, imperiled, polluting liabilities to becoming the jewels of the future clean energy system, producing hydrogen and heat and desalinated water. And, you know, it's, it, this I think this idea that emissions-free, reliable, low-cost heat is actually the kind of core of you know unlocking all kinds of wonderful energy services. Jeff. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, the the. We're talking about the terawatt challenge, right? And I came to nuclear through climate. So I spent 15 years in the federal government. I was uh, chief of staff of the Department of Energy in, my, in, in the last job that I had in the government in the Obama administration. And we've talked a lot about how hard it is to decarbonize the power sector, right? Um, the challenge is immense, right? And in some kind of ways can be very, very daunting. When you talk about you don't think about that risk. The power sector's by far the easiest low-hanging fruit that we have to deal with when it comes to decarbonizing. And the challenge is immense, right? When you start talking about transportation, industrial, agriculture, a lot of the tools that we need to decarbonize those sectors aren't fully developed yet. We can decarbonize power. We have all the tools we need. We just have to deploy them at scale very rapidly, right? And integrate them into a system that can operate. It's you know easier said than done, but that's all we have to do to decarbonize the power sector. When you're talking about all of the things that we need to do, particularly in industry, you need very, very high temperature heat in order to do those things. And right now, that heat is only available if you're burning fossil fuels, right? So our reactor is not particularly hot. It's 550 degrees Celsius, which in nuclear isn't all that hot. But uh, the other ARDP award winner, X Energy, uh, I think they're at about 750 degrees C. Right, I know the molten salt designs can get very, very high uh, temperature and the things that they do as well. But if we're going to do things like continue to have products that are chemicals uh, that, um, you know, uh, uh, that, that we need 
uh, to do all the things that we need to do. If we're going to figure out how to have synthetic fuels that are going to allow us to fly, continue to fly airplanes and run ships. All of these things are going to require sources of zero carbon heat, right? So, um, you know, it was interesting to me when I, when I came into this um, world, the nuclear world, I came out of a government, like I said, it didn't, I didn't realize that there was some huge fight over renewables versus nuclear because it didn't occur to us as you're thinking about these big challenges that you would exclude the largest source of clean energy and say, we don't need that anymore. We're gonna just do, put a bunch of solar panels on rooftops and solve the problem, right? It's just not realistic. Um, but when you start thinking about all of the other pieces where we don't have the fully developed tools to decarbonize, um, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to, to, to limit, limit our options. So it's going to take innovation uh, and big thinking. Companies like Microsoft are doing that. Think tanks like TerraPraxis are doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, I actually kind of feel pretty excited about the opportunity right in the, in the face of the, of the challenge. And, you know, there's a lot of innovative companies here uh, this weekend that are, this week that are, that are uh, going to be key parts of it. But we need everybody. We need the whole thing, right? Like, we're, we're not even close to the period of being able to say we have the luxury of excluding certain sources of, of carbon-free energy. Yeah, brilliant. Well, there's, there's certainly lots of work to get around, right? That's for sure. And, and Connor, you know, again, sort of business interruption, and, you know, resilience, as Rita was mentioning earlier, you know, these are really critical considerations in planning the transition. And one of the opportunities to reduce the risk of failure to decarbonize is enabling continuous operations as much as possible. Because if we can you continue to repurpose but use our existing uh, distribution, storage, transport, end use infrastructure, that then requires we don't have to invest in new infrastructure, new associated, associated infrastructure. The opportunity to new power coal plants, for example, enables us to continue using that transmission. And building transmission is really hard. So um, tell us a bit about you know, your, your sort of perspective on those opportunities to switch out um, you know, polluting fossil fuel waste sources of energy, clean energy, and continued economic, you know, continuing global economy to function. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so probably a few things I could think of. So um, presently, um, so data centers require very, very high uptime. Um, you know, the five nines, 99.999 percent availability of cloud services. That means data centers can't go down. Um, and so uh, presently, uh, backup so there's um, UPS um, continuous power systems essentially to back up the grid. And diesel generators are currently used, um, but diesel generators are not ideal for many reasons. Um, that aside from when you use them, um, they generate emissions. You also have very high um, maintenance loads associated with them. You need to cycle them regularly just to keep them uh, going. So uh, we have a goal of phasing out diesel in its entirety for backup for all Microsoft data centers globally. Um, and so that's a challenge then for the technologies that are uh, used to back up uh, those data centers. Um, and so that's just one kind of interesting area for reusing existing technologies or looking into new technologies um, to you know, back, up, um, back up data centers in order to clearly solve the problem, but just keeping an open mind in terms of the technologies that do that. Maybe it'll be a range of technologies that do so. Um, so that's maybe one. Um, one kind of interesting area, um, yes. Yeah, and resilience and system thinking, you know, again, it's like rather than thinking about the individual technologies, you're thinking about how they perform overall in the system. Um, so we'll, we've got a, uh, seven or so minutes left. I'm looking around the room to see if anyone has any questions for our very distinguished panel. Um, but if I would like to do a rapid fire round before we close as well. Any questions from anyone? No? You've all been so clear <laughs> and articulate. Articulate, wonderful. Um, oh, yeah, I have a question. Please. What, uh, with the current technologies and the leader of those. Oh, there's a, there is a microphone, I'm sorry. It's just coming. Um, so then we need to wait to hear it too. And I'm going to close by asking what this success looks like. Well, with the current technology in nuclear that we've discussed today, how does the cost on a dollar per megawatt hour compare with the current 
price of the demand for solar and wind at scale. Um, I'm happy to take a shot at that. So, um, you know, if you're going to try to add a kilowatt to the grid, you're going to do that with wind or solar, depending upon where you are geographically in the country. Um, there's just, I mean, you know, the cost is so cheap for a solar panel or for wind turbine in terms of just generating that electricity. If you're going to try to get to a system that is 100% clean, however, you're going to need generation attributes like, you know, dispatchability, firm, uh, and the ability to ramp. So uh, on our system, the Terrapower system, we estimate 50 to $60 a megawatt hour all in, including that 500 megawatts, you know, gigawatt scale energy storage uh, included, included with it. So, so we think it's a value to the utility. That's really, really good. But yeah, if you're, one, if you're gonna want to add a kilowatt, you know, just what's the marginal out. cost then to go from 345 to 500? So, uh, you know, um, and Chris can talk a lot about this, about how you reduce the cost of deploying nuclear. Um, building multiple units at a site obviously brings down the overall cost, right? Um, um, uh, also, a way we can tell you like, fully licensed to start construction. Um, <laughs> that to do that. Um, but, um, um, yeah, so, so there are, you know, we're building the first one. First of a kind one's going to be expensive. That's why we're doing the cost share with the federal government. Um, but, um, and obviously that, that energy storage component can totally change. We can do longer duration at a smaller volume. We can do higher duration at a, or higher storage capacity at a, at a smaller, smaller one as well. So we do envision building multiple plants at a single site that can bring down uh, that overall cost. Great question. Over, overnight cost of construction in the $2,800 to $3,000 range. Would you expect this to come down? That's, that's out of the time. That will be yeah. the first one. Right. Oh, I have another uh, question. Uh, oh. uh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, my apologies. Um, you said that you were skipping the steam cycle and going to molten salt with the heat. Where do the electrons come out? How do you get to the electrons? Generate steam from the molten salt. Oh, yes. Yeah. The molten salt is basically stored. Correct. Yep. And um, the fuel rods, are they using pebbles, fuel rods, and, and what's the waste situation? Yeah, we're, we're using uh, metallic fuel rods. Uh, we operate at a, a fast spectrum. So we are able to burn, we get a higher efficiency and able to burn more of the fuel, but we will still produce uh, spent fuel rods that will go in the pool, then go into dry cast storage, uh, and then eventually go into permanent repository. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question. A question about the smaller modular uh, atoms. In terms of this uh, AP consideration, are there on a different spectrum than the larger signs to be able to pay the cost for? Oh, yeah. Should we invite Rita to you? Yeah. Rita, could you hear the question of okay, the safety considerations of the new small modular reactors compared to uh, traditional light water? Yeah. Sure, sure. So I mean, because they do have a small footprint, um, regulatory authorities around the world and in the United States, it's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, are considering uh, what the impact is on what's called the emergency plan zone, the EPC. And, and the logic is that uh, because you have a small footprint, you also can really shrink down the size of that EPC. So that's number one. The, the other aspect to consider is that many of the SMRs that are being designed are being designed with passive safety features uh, baked in. And so they're considered walk away safe. So that's another um, aspect. And the third is that many of those reactor designs are also being designed with uh, ambient pressure operating conditions. So you're not pressurized uh, as many of uh, today's, it's called, you know, pressurized water reactors are. And so you have um, different safety margins that have to be considered, but you're operating at ambient pressure. And so a huge um, aspect of the safety requirements that are required for today's reactors are not going to be in those uh, ambient pressure operating designs of the future. Wonderful. Thank you. Do you want to add anything to that? No, that's great. Great. Um, okay, well, these were great questions. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with this rapid fire round. Uh, we've got about two minutes left. So um, just let's end on a kind of positive visionary note here for the terawatt transition. Uh, what does success look like in you know, 2030, 2035? What's, tell us 
what you see. Success looks like keeping the existing plans operational. They can operate to 80 years, and now there's conversation of having existing plans operate to 100 years. That's number one. Number two is to have sort of a proliferation of new nuclear plants. Uh, definitely part of the pun. Um, <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> So maybe a little further up in 2035 or 2030, but the goal here is that we enable access to affordable energy to everybody in the world who needs it, and we do it without emitting carbon dioxide. Like that, like that's that's what we're all up for. Like that's the whole point of all of this. And and obviously, um, I think nuclear can play can play a role in that. But it's going to be a role, and there's a whole lot of other things that we need to develop and deploy to make that happen. Amazing, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Energy is like profoundly important yes. for our quality of life, for our civilization. You understand this? I don't know, Microsoft. Yeah, that's exactly it. I would say that we've successfully decoupled carbon emissions from productivity, but also quality of life growth, not just for the developed world, but for the developing world too. Wonderful. Well, okay, well, let's all come back in you know, 10 years from now and see what, what progress we've been making. So please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, and thank you all so much for your attention.